James chapter 1. Shall I get in there? My wife, my daughter's getting my glasses clean. They're, they're got something on. I can't get it off, and the, the lights are just making them do weird stuff. Hallelujah. You know, God's good. Everybody say, God is good. You remember when Jesus was, was uh, out one day, and somebody came in and said, Good master. And Jesus stopped and said, Why callest thou me good? There is none good save God alone or except God alone. And of course, his rhetorical question was basically this, are you calling me God? Are you rec or do you recognize who I am by calling me good? <clears throat> God is good. Everybody say, God is good. Yeah. How often is God good? Oh. All the time. But God told me I couldn't run around and, and fornicate. God's good because sin will kill you. Hello? God doesn't tell you not to do certain things because he doesn't want you to have fun. He tells you not to do certain things because they'll kill you. Hello? Y'all hear you going home. Be, li living in sin hurts. It destroys. It brings destruction. God didn't tell you. God doesn't, uh, uh, God doesn't restrict you living by your flesh because he hates you. He, you know, he restricts you living by your flesh because you shoot up and do drugs, it'll kill you. You drop acid and you'll be a lunatic the rest of your life. Hello? You'll have flashbacks. You'll be rocking around one day and you'll think you're a bird flying out a window. Some of y'all remember all of a sudden, uh, what was it, Art Linkletter's daughter jumped out a window and different people taking acid and stuff, dropped, just did crazy stuff. Well, God didn't want you not dropping acid because he, acid, he didn't want you to have a psychedelic, you know, uh, uh, what is it, heffalumps and woozles or whatever from, <laughs> huh? Heffalumps and how many remember, uh, ever saw Dumbo? Remember the scene where the guy dropped acid before he painted the pictures? The half lumps and the woozles, that's it. That guy had to be on an acid trip when they did that whole stretch of that movie. It was the weirdest thing I've ever seen in a cartoon movie, and it was all psychedelic. It was like somebody was on an acid trip, you know? Well, see, God doesn't restrict us from doing things because he doesn't want us to have fun. God restricts us from things that will kill us or destroy us or bring destruction. That's good. That's goodness. You know, if I go out here on the interstate because the bridge is out and I do everything I can to stop your car from running into the river and killing you, uh, and you go, you impeded my progress. No, I'm trying to save your life. Amen. Hallelujah. James chapter 1 verse 16 says, do not err. Everybody say, do not err. My beloved brethren. Who's he talking to? Church. When he calls you beloved brethren, he ain't talking to sinners. You know, uh, who are the epistles written to? Church. What, watch it when people come on and say, that's not for the church. They, well, what do you mean it's not for the church? It's in there. Hallelujah. Every good and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will he begat us with the word of truth that we should be the first fruits of his creatures. Now, let's, let's stop it for a second. Every good and every perfect gift cometh down from the Father above, with whom there is no variableness. Do not mistake the goodness of God with the fact that he is not also a God of justice. God loves you, but God also has requirements in his word. I love people who come along and say, There's, well, you don't have to do anything the law says. Well, I would just take and go get, uh, I believe, Ephesians or Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, and tear it out of your Bible. Hello? Just rip it out. Why should I take and rip it out of my Bible? It's, it's, it's Ephesians. Hallelujah. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment we promise. I don't, we, God don't give commandments. Well, he did right there. But Paul didn't believe in them. Paul's the one that wrote that. God is good. God loves you so much. But, you know, God, in, in his goodness, he has, <clears throat> he has parameters. I love my children. You know, you got, you got um, uh, about 40 years ago, back in the 60s, this, I don't know if he was well-meaning or just well-deceived, pediatrician wrote a book. It became the parenting handbook for a whole generation, okay? And it was written by a guy named Dr. Spock. I'm not talking about the pointy-ear guy from Star Trek. All right? And he wrote a book on all kinds of things like, don't, don't spank your children, you teach them to hit. Don't, don't restrict your children because you inhibit their creativity. Well, I'm going to tell you something. I, if, if my kids keep trying to reach up and grab a hot stove with their hand, I'm going to do something to stop them. I'm going to do everything in my power to stop them, and then I'm going to whack or 
You know, I'm from the South, okay? Just don't take my term. They're old enough. You can't get me for child abuse. They're adults now. Hallelujah. I'm going to pop that hand or I'm going to pop their back. Set. I'm going to reinforce to them that putting their hand up there is going to cause them a problem. Why? Not because I'm mean and hateful and just looking for an opportunity to beat them. I'm trying to save them from putting the hand up there and leaving the rest of their, their skin on the stove where it got cooked off. I love them. I care for them. God is good even when he says, no, you can't do that. But you got people running around saying, I'm living with my girlfriend and boyfriend. It's okay because we're under grace. Ah! No, it's not okay. Now, if you're doing that, just look right straight ahead, keep a smile on your face, and nobody will know I'm preaching to you. <laughs> Except you and Jesus. All right? Why? Because sin is destructive. So understand, we talk about the goodness of God, that God is a good God. There is things in his goodness that says no. You don't shoot up. You don't smoke. Why don't you smoke? Because they'll give you cancer. Hello? Women, dear Lord, don't smoke. Do you know what you're going to look like at 50? I, I had a girl I went to high school with. And in high school, she was a really cute girl. Had, had like baby fat on her face. Really attractive girl. And, and, and now today, she's smoked for, for 30, 40 years. I mean, all that's gone. And, and it does something funny to your teeth. The gums begin to get smaller and, and shrivel. And it, it makes sure it, does, it just it ruins your skin. And I'm telling you, I'm thinking... <sighs> Look at the picture of the end, you look at the picture of her now, you go, oh, dear Lord Jesus, what happened? Cigarettes. Bad for you. Bad for you. Well, God doesn't want you not to smoke. Like one preacher said, if God wanted you to smoke, he'd put a smokestack on your head. <laughs> it's not that God doesn't want you to enjoy the flavor of something. The carcinogenics and tobacco are bad for you. We've proven that. Janie's, Janie's grandfather had lip cancer. They just took out his lip. He, kept, he just kept his pipe right in the little hole. That man smoked the pipe and just, he, when they cut out the lip, he said, well, good place to stick the pipe in and hold it. It just slid in with the mouth closed. You know, people get tongue cancer, all that kind of stuff. You know, it's not that God doesn't want you to have fun. God believes in fun. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, so let's say this. So every good and perfect gift comes down from above. Now, let me, let me also say this. Satan is always offering substitutes for what God wants to bless you with. God wants you to have fun. Everybody say, God wants you to have fun. Amen. Now, you know, um, anybody here under 13? All right. God does not put restrictions on sex because he doesn't want you to have sex. He's the one that created it. Amen. Y'all hear you went home. But he also created within, within, within the parameters of the marital relationship as an expression of love and for procreation. Now, that throws out the homosexual. There is no procreation in homosexuality. That went over big. I saw some pastor the other day. He's, he's a local pastor in the state of North Carolina that, that, that I have a, I know from somebody else. He's for repealing Amendment 1 in North Carolina. Why? You know? You know, God doesn't want people not having, you know, there's, there's all kinds of problems with, with, with having sex outside of marriage. When Magic Johnson found out he had HIV, you know how many women they said he had slept with? 20,000. You can't even keep a diary like that. <laughs> Hello? Now, they put it on television because every woman they ever slept with them had to go get checked. Are you here? Well, if you, if, you, if you live, listen to me now, if you live holy and pure until your wedding night and you're married and you only have relations with your spouse your whole life, you don't have to worry about being one of magic's tragedies. That's why God says no. It's not that he doesn't want you to have fun. He wants you to have fun in the right way. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, my son, I love my son. My son does some of the dumbest, has done some of the dumbest things in life. I don't mind him having fun, but I don't want him rollerblading down the slide at the playground with no wrist guards on and break his arm, which he did. We didn't tell him don't go anywhere without your wrist guards on because we didn't want him to have fun. We didn't tell him don't go anywhere without your wrist guards on because on a rollerblades you can fall down and break a wrist, which he did. Because he slipped off without us looking. Beware your sins will find you out. All right. He came home and said, I think I broke my arm. I grabbed it. Oh, no, you didn't. He just fell down the floor and collapsed. Oh, I guess he did. Uh. 
Hallelujah. All right. So let's, go, let's, let's kind of move along here and, and just understand that, that, that in, in preaching and we talk about God and God says don't do this or God says you can't do that or God says this. It's, that is still part of his goodness. God's restrictions on your flesh is still an aspect of his goodness because he doesn't want you to be hurt or injured. Remember back in the Garden of Eden when um, Adam and Eve were in the garden? And God, you know, Satan comes to Eve and says, half, half God said, Satan always questions God's word. Half God said, thou shalt not eat of the fruit of the tree. And she says, he's told us not to eat it or even, or he told us not to eat it or even touch it. See, she got mixed up. God never said to eat it. Don't touch it. They were to dress the garden. They were to keep the garden. He told them, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, let me put something here. There's one reason. There's two reasons for this. One is, the lesson was that the knowledge of good and evil is not good. It's not good. It's not good to know the ways of sin. Oh, I can minister more effectively if I was a prostitute. Hogwash. Oh, I was a prostitute. That means I'm called to minister to prostitutes. No, it doesn't. You might be called to minister to the straightest people you'll ever feel on, meet on the planet. Amen. Some people think because, you know, I speak five languages, I'm called to certain areas of the country. You know, Paul was the most qualified person on the planet to minister to the Jews, and God sent him to the Gentiles. Peter was most qualified to minister to the Gentiles, and God sent him to the Jews. Peter didn't have a bit of eloquence. I mean, you know, being able to go argue the law with all the Pharisees and stuff was not Peter's forte. I mean, as a matter of fact, the night they came to get Jesus, he cut some guy's ear off. Can you see? You could use that for Gentiles. Hey, dude, I want to tell you what. When they came to get Jesus, I was there. I was for him. I cut some dude's ear off. He made me go get it and put it back on. But anyway, that's beside. I, God didn't use him that way. He used it for the Gen, for the Jews. Amen. Just because you were a prostitute doesn't mean you're called to go minister on the streets. Just because you were a drug addict doesn't mean you're called to go minister to drug addicts. You think you're qualified. And we, in the natural, we always think that. No, you're qualified to minister where God calls you. And that's where you need to be. Amen? All right. So, now let's say this, number one. God is for you. Say, God is for me. Hallelujah. Deuteronomy 31, 6 says, Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. For the Lord thy God, he is thee that, do, that, that do, goeth with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. God's always with you, even when you mess up. I said, even when you mess up, God's for you, and God's there. I will not forsake thee. God's not going to leave the minute you sin. Well, I don't believe I can sin. Well, you, you, read your Bible. I said, read your Bible. John wrote to the church, These things write I unto you that ye sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. James 5, 16, or 12 through 16 talks about that if there's any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church, the anointing of all, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And if he's committed sin, who? The, the, if any among you. If any among you. If any among you. Who's talking about? The church. If they sin, they'll be forgiven them. Amen. Jesus didn't forsake you because you sin. As a matter of fact, uh, Hebrews tells us that there's a throne called the throne of grace that we can come with boldness to. Why? Because Jesus is our redeemer. Jesus is our advocate. Jesus is the one who argues our case based on his blood. That we can come with a boldness to the presence of God even in the midst of having committed sin because he will not forsake us. He will extend mercy and grace towards us in the time of need. God is good. I said God is good. God loves you. God's on your side. Amen? Now listen, I, you know, uh, I, we talked about at the beginning how that God has parameters and tells you not to do certain things. That, now, I, I used to be a computer programmer back in the old days. Uh, my, first, my, my first job programming was on an old IBM Mod three, uh, 360 Mod 40. Now, that, if you want to know what that is, just go look up a dinosaur in the dictionary and you'll see that machine sitting there. That's an old, old, old computer. All right? I'm telling you, I mean, when you're talking about CRTs, they didn't have computer data entry stations. You had to, you had to put all kinds of software and, and interfaces on it to, to trick the machine into thinking that it was reading cards when it was reading the screen. 
All right? The one I program don't actually have hexadecimal, 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 hexadecimal dials on the side. You can dial in your command lines one at a time. And hex and punch, hex and punch. You can program it that way. That's a dinosaur. That's a dinosaur. All right? I was going to make a point with that great big machine there. What was I going to say? Living right. Hallelujah. There was a great point. I had this great point with a computer. Huh? Nah, it wasn't going to be garbage in, garbage out. Just a, my first job programming. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I mean, these were the machines that you, you had to put all the, 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 the coding and you had to tell it backslash the, where, where, where the sector was, where the program was, and all that kind of stuff. All right? And sometimes we begin to think that, you know, everything's on automatic. We, we, we got programmers now who use certain level languages that they're not programmers. They just take, oh, I want to make it do this. So I take this little picture and I draw it over here and it does all the code for them. That's called object-oriented programming. It does it all for them. And we just think we're going to pull the grace button over here and everything's going to be done for us automatically. Yet God's Word has things that we're supposed to do. God wants us to live a certain way out of his commandments. Amen. God wants us to walk a certain way out of his commandments. God wants us to do things a certain way. But it's out of his goodness that the provision is made for us to be able to do it. Amen. God loves you even when you're in sin. God loves you when you make a mistake. God doesn't reject you and throw you out the front door because you did sin. But he does say come to the throne of grace in that time of need. There is mercy and there is grace available. And if you will come, you can appropriate it. I like to say it this way. There is a side of God. There's a side of the side of the equation for the, between the believer and God is there's a side called the Godward side and it's called grace. But on the other side, there's a man beside called faith. By grace are you saved through faith. Not, not yourselves, it's the gift of God. Amen. God provided the means. Faith is how we appropriate it. Amen. And it's not a work of yourself, but it is of, the, you have to use the faith to get it. So, he will not forsake you. Now, you still have the opportunity to come to his throne and receive forgiveness. Let me say this. He doesn't drag you to the throne. As a matter of fact, Hebrews says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Now, you need a revelation of the goodness of God to come with boldness to his grace throne. You got to know God loves you. He's not going to reject you. Mm -hmm. Amen. That when you come, even in, even in the midst of having committed sin, his love for you and his mercy towards you is extended even in that state where you've done something like that. Amen. But you must still, you still must come to receive it. But you see, so many people want to go hide themselves and run from God because they think God's going to get them. Now, let me tell you something. If God was going to get anybody, San Francisco would all be floating out in the ocean. <laughs> He'd have chopped it off a long time ago. Amen. If God was in the business of bringing God, listen, I'm telling you, if God's judgment was all over the earth like some judgmental people preach, San Francisco had been, done been long gone and California would be hanging on by a thread. Hello. The Middle East, except for Israel, would be glass. He'd have nuked it by now. God is, he's long suffering. You know what, James, James says something really interesting. He said that God, that the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it. He's withholding his judgment to get as many people in as he can. He's good. He loves people. Now there is a day coming when judgment will come on the earth. But in goodness and mercy, he is withholding that to get as many people into the kingdom as he can get. As many that will believe as can believe. Eventually it's coming. But God is being good. He's holding it back. He's holding it back. He's holding it back. He's holding it back. Now, if God is willing, remember Ephesians says this. Ephesians chapter 2 says that even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, if Christ died for the ungodly, even when you were dead in your trespasses and sins, what do you think he'll do for the believer who missed the mark? It's still extended to you. Love and mercy and favor is still extended to you. You can come. You still have to come. Don't run and hide, but you still got to come and receive. 1 John 1, 9. I know there's a lot of debate about this lately, but I don't really care what the debate is. The, the, you know, the Bible says what it says. Amen. 1 John 1.
That, well, let's just read first. We'll read the whole first chapter, all right? Put it in context. That which we've heard from the beginning, that which, we've, uh, uh, that which was from the beginning, that which we've heard, that which we've seen with our eyes, that which we've looked upon in our hands and have handled of the word of life. For this life was manifested, and we've seen him, and bear witness, and showed unto you that, etern that eternal life, which was with the Father, and manifest unto us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with, Father, with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things I write unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message that you've heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us of our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, these things I write unto you, that ye sin not. Now, chapter 2, stuck in the eight, is not a new, it is not a new thought. It is a continuation of what he said, my little children. James, John is writing to the church. And he says, if we confess our sins. Well, now, look, now let's hold your place right here real quick. Because this is the goodness of God, folks. See, some people think if you teach about or talk about sin, you're, 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 you're not talking about the goodness of God. Oh, my. When I talk about sin in the light of redemption, I'm talking about the goodness of God. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. I don't have to go get born again again. I don't have to go and offer a priest a sacrifice. I don't have to, you know, cut myself and climb up down on the, knee, the church on my knees and do penance and do 400 Hail Marys and 300 hundred Our Fathers and, you know, and do all this stuff. I just come boldly to the throne of grace in the time of need, hallelujah. And there is for mercy, there's forgiveness from the Father. Even when I was born again and loved him and walked with him, I missed the mark. He still loves me and will not forsake me. Romans 10, 8, but what saith that the word is nigh thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Let me ask you something. Is there one word written here by Paul about confessing your sins? Is there? Is there a single reference to confessing your sins here? No. You confess Jesus as Lord. You believe in your heart God's raised. Wow. The sinner can't confess all his sins. It's impossible. You'd miss, all you got to do is miss one and you're in trouble if you had to confess them all. And I'm sure you did something at seven years old that you can't remember. I guarantee it. Hello. <laughs> but James says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Oh, thank God. Who's he talking to? My little children. My little children. Why is that in the Bible? That is in the Bible because the believer has the potential to sin. Amen? What did John say? My little children, I think right the same unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. It's God's desire. Everybody says God's desire that we don't sin. God doesn't want you to sin. But, oh, the goodness of God. He made a provision for the believer that if you do so, oh, how good is God? I say, how good is God? Oh, how the goodness and grace and mercy of God that even when we sin, he's made a provision that if we will confess that sin, the righteous judge Jesus Christ will come before his throne and say, my blood purchased their redemption, hallelujah, and wash us clean. That is grace. Oh, my, that is grace on steroids, folks. Because he didn't have to do that. He could have said, here's the deal. I'm sending Jesus, and I'm going to give you a shot. And if you confess him and, and, and live right and don't ever miss it again, you'll make heaven. But I'm telling you one thing. The first time you mess up, the first time you sin, don't come knocking on my door. You're going to hell. He could have done that. I said he could have done that. But thank God he didn't. Oh, whoo, glory. I said glory. 
He did not. Why? Because he said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake. Now listen, no, you can't go misinterpret that. I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. Hebrews makes it clear you can forsake him. Hebrews chapter 6. You'd be stupid. You'd be dumb on steroids if you did that. It can be done. But he's not going to leave you and he's not going to forsake you. He's made provision. He strives with you. When you sin, if you, listen, why are we talking about sin? I want you to get to understand this. God's dealings with you if and when, or if you sin, not, well, I'm not going to say you when you sin, uh, but if you sin, God's dealings with you are out of his goodness because he loves you and he wants to restore you. He wants to erase that out of your consciousness. Oh, thank God. I said, thank God. There is a cleansing that takes place in the confession of sin when you committed sin. Now, I ain't talking, you don't come to Pastor Ed, and we don't meet in some little booth, and I don't pull a curtain, and you don't come in and say, forgive me, Pastor, for I have sinned. And I say, when was your last confession, my child? And they say, on March 31st, of 2008. Been that long? That's probably the response you get. I think on that first Zorro movie when, when, uh, when Zorro is pretending to be the priest, she says, he says, when was your last confession? She said, uh, last Saturday. He said, what could you have done in a week? <laughs> you know, then he confess again. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, but you don't come to Pastor Ed and start confessing to me when I, you know, uh, uh, I cussed this week at work and, and, I, and, I slapped, and I slapped the dog across the room and I, and, I, and, and I need forgiveness. And I say, okay, go paint the church four times. And come again clean, my child. Well, you'd have a gig going on. As a matter of fact, I got four houses I want you to paint this week. You go paint them, I get the money. It works. This confession, we can really, we can manipulate this confessions deal. No, we don't, who do you confess them to? You go to the Father. You come to the throne of grace in that time of need. You confess before the Father that I missed the mark, I sinned. And Jesus stands up when you do that. And he says, I am his lawyer, I am his advocate. And he's come before you, he's, he is in me. My blood has granted and guaranteed him forgiveness in this moment. And it says here, if we confess our sins, he is faithful. And, see, not only is he faithful, he's faithful and just. What's he basing the forgiveness on? What Jesus did. He has a just reason to forgive you. And Jesus is there to make sure that your case is heard. And, it's a, and I tell you, after 2,000 years, he's got the argument down real good. He probably just now just had to stand up and point at the mercy seat and they go, forgiven. My blood. My blood purchased it. I shed my blood on Calvary. Hallelujah. I descended into the region of the damned. I became sin for them who knew no sin, that they may be made the righteousness of God in me. And I was raised up for their justification and sat down at your right hand, Father. And now they've missed the mark, but they're a child of God and they've come before you. And my blood still cries out forgiven. My blood still cries out holy. My blood still cries out righteous. And the Father says, well done, accept it. Hallelujah. Talk about grace. <clears throat> but notice that the Word of God says, let us come to the throne of grace. It didn't say it's coming to you. God's made the provision. God wants you to know he's good. Say he's good. Say he is good. God wants you to have a revelation of his goodness. But you still have to come to him. Well, I don't believe that. Have you read where James said, draw nine to me and I'll draw nine to thee, says the Lord? Hello? That's the B-I-B-L-E. Oh, yes, that's the book for me. Remember that song, a little nursery rhyme? I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Woo! So you're going, I ain't ever heard that one. Okay, next year we're going to have vacation Bible school for people who didn't go to vacation Bible school. And we'll let you come as adults and go through all the stuff you need to go through and learn all the little songs you need to learn. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Dave, look to the 37th Psalm, please. Uh, 
I love this scripture. I'm telling you, when you're going through a tough place, when the devil's sitting on your shoulder and says, remember, you did such and such back in 2003, and God hadn't forgiven you yet, you can say, oh, but the blood of Jesus cleansed me from all unrighteousness. Glory to God. I came to the throne of grace. But I like David. I'm telling you right now, David was, you know, that's what he says here in, in verse um, Psalm 37. And... Uh, Verse 25. I knew it was a five. I was looking in the wrong place. I've been young, and now I'm old. Stop. Don't read anymore. I've had a life experience. Mr. C was young. Now he's older. Not old, are you, Mr. C? You're not old, are you? No, he's just older. Hallelujah. Miss Geraldine, is he old? Mature, okay. <laughs> so I went and visited Mr. C last week, and he, and he said, people ask him, how does he know, know, such, uh, know so much history? He said, because I've lived most of it. <laughs> Hallelujah. David says, I have a life experience. Now, a number of years ago, we, we had a minivan we took up to the, the Crown uh, Dodge dealership here in town. And uh, this young whippersnapper came out. And I guess he's about 18 or 19 years old, or maybe 20. Had just got out, had to have just gotten out of community college in auto mechanics. You know what I mean? And door, the van's doing something weird, and he crawls up underneath it and comes crawling out about 10 minutes later. And Janie's standing there, and he goes, I ain't never seen nothing like that all my life. She was not impressed. <laughs> Now, if the old guy in the back came walking up and crawled under there, and he'd been doing this for 60 years, and come out and goes, I haven't seen, like, seen anything like this in all my life, then that would have been impressive. <laughs> but when you're 20 and you've been working on cars three weeks and you haven't seen anything like that in all your life, it, okay, you just haven't lived long enough. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? I mean, you're not impressed when a young person says, I ain't never seen anything like that in my whole life. Then when Mr. C says, I've never seen anything like that all my life, I'm, I'm interested. <laughs> all right? David said, I was young, but now I'm old. I have a full life experience. Oh, praise God. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken? nor his seed begging bread. He is ever merciful and lendeth, and his seed is blessed. David says, I have a life experience that shows me from being young to old that God has never forsaken the righteous. God has never left his seed begging for bread. I can tell you, David said, I can tell you something from a life experience. You can count on God. You can count on God to never forsake you, to never leave you, to never leave your seed begging for bread. And I have a life experience to prove it. And think of the things that David went through. Hello? Think of all the stuff he went through. He was not the favorite of his brothers. He was the heart playing sheep herder. I mean, when they, you know, I mean, can you imagine that when your dad won't even call you in for a shot at the kingdom? Think about it. He doesn't even bother calling David in for a trial run at it. He goes through all the sons except David. Finally, finally. Samuel says, is there another? Because he, he knew that Jesse had a son that God had called him. All, all the Lord told him is, you go to the house of Jesse, and you anoint his son to be king over Israel. And he gets there, and Jesse goes, oh, praise God, and starts dragging him out. You know, oldest to the youngest, except David. He left him in the field. Finally, is there, I mean, he got to get here. That's ain't him. Why did the Lord just tell him who was up front? You wouldn't be walking by sight, not by faith. If the Lord showed you everything you're supposed to do every day from now until the end, you wouldn't walk by faith, you'd walk by sight. There's going to be some things you just have to do. The Lord's told us to do something as a church. We're going to be doing it soon. We're going to reveal it soon. It's coming. So I mean, when are you going to tell us? It's been three months. Uh, this when? When he says go. 
And we're walking it out by faith because I ain't got it figured out. I still ain't quite got it figured out. But if you told me exactly how to do everything to start with, I'd be walking by sight and not by faith. So he sends Samuel over there and just says, go anoint one of his sons. So here's the house, trial and error. He comes, no, that's not him. Oh, that's not him. Oh, that's not him. Oh, that's not, finally gets through and finally gets down to all of them except one. And, and they didn't even know about the other one. He got any more kids? Well, yeah, we got the part playing sheep herder out there. He's out there singing lullabies to the sheep. <laughs> Lullaby and good night. Little sheepies go to sleep. I mean, he's just out playing his harp. <laughs> Well, we're, go, go get him because we ain't going to eat until he shows up. They sent somebody out there. Well, there's some prophet dude up there who wants to see you. He comes walking up. You know, I don't know if he's vetted the ukulele by now. He might be singing tiptoe through the tulips. You know, as he goes to the house. And as he gets to the house, the Lord says, Arise, anoint him. Hallelujah. His brothers, his own family didn't have any faith in him. But y'all here, you're going home. Saul tries to kill him. Once Saul finds out he's been anointed to take his place, he tries to kill him. Every time he turns around, he tries to kill him. He'd come in and sing and get the devil off of him, and then he'd get mad about it, pick up a spear and try to throw it at him and kill him. Hello? Then he gets to be king, and he got a, he got a flesh problem. He sits there and watches naked women take baths. Well, that'll get your flesh messed up. Hello, now I don't have time to go in that whole thing. Let me tell you something. Had David been where he was supposed to be, he'd never seen Bathsheba. The Bible says there was a time, that it was a season that the kings went out to war, yet David remained behind in Jerusalem and went up on his rooftop and saw Bathsheba sunbathing. And she'd taken a bath butt naked. His hormones still worked. Hello? I said, Hello? commits adultery with her, has her husband, has, has, creates a conspiracy to commit murder, then actually has the murder committed, takes her as his wife, the child dies, all this stuff. I mean, he goes through a bunch of stuff. His son, his son rapes the daughter. He kills his son. His son gets killed in, in the battle. His son tries to overthrow his throne, Absalom. In the end of all these things, David says, I was young, and now I am old, and I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging for bread. Oh, thank God. There is a mercy of God that is greater than your failures. And when you fail, there is a place to come to the almighty hallelujah called the throne of grace. The throne of grace is not some stupid flake oh crazy thing where you can do whatever you want to do and get away with it. It is the place that you can come in the place of despair, in the place of missing the mark, in the place of, of rebelling against God, and you can come and the mercies and forgiveness of God are available even in the state that you've come into because he loves you and forgives you. Thank God. Thank God for his goodness. God is good. I said, God is good. And David, David testified, I was young and now I'm old. And I've not seen the righteous forsaken. Never seen. That's a big statement. I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. Amen? Hallelujah. Glory to God. So Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Where's God? He's with you. Be not dismayed. Why? For I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Amen. God says, don't be afraid. I am with you. Now, Jesus went on and said this. He's, been with, he's with us, he'll, not, but he'll be in us not many days hence. The Holy Ghost dwelt with us, then he became into us. Today, I want you to have a revelation. God is good. 
God is not looking for an opportunity to send you to hell. God's, and see, and that's what religion does teach that. <coughs> the God's, you know, God's just angry. God's, God's, I mean, you know, how many remember when you were a kid, somebody used God's name in vain, you'd back up and say, I don't want, lightning going to strike you. Don't want to stand, you know, kind of. Well, we kind of had this idea, the man upstairs, he's going to get you. Well, if God was going to get anybody, we wouldn't even be here. If he's in the getting your business, we'd all been wiped out. Hello. I said, hello. He could have already wiped out the whole bunch. God loves, say, God, just take your finger, take your finger, take your finger. Put it right there, put it on in your nose, and say, God, God loves, loves me. me. God loves you. God is for you. He is, will not forsake you. He says, I am your God. I am your God. See, when we talk about, let's understand, there's the God side and there's the man side. You know, Ephesians is a great example. If you'll study the book of Ephesians, you'll find out it's divided into two halves. Chapters 1 through 3 and chapters 4, 5, 6. 1 through 3 are who we are in Christ, what we have in Christ, where we're positioned in Christ, what he's done for us in Christ. Chapters 4, 5, and 6 are what we do because we're in Christ, what we have to, what, we're, what our responsibility is because we're in Christ, um, the things we're required to do because we're in Christ. He starts out the fourth chapter and says, What worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called? You study that in the Greek, and it's, talk, it's a transitionary clause, meaning because all this has been done, here's what you're supposed to do. Amen? I'm telling you today, God's good. God is good toward you. God will not forsake you. God is your God. He will not leave you. He loves you. He wants best for you. He has your best interest at heart. We respond in faith to his goodness by walking in accordance with his word and his plan for our life. Amen. That which he's promised us. You know, Peter says this very interesting statement. He says, Wherefore, giving unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these, what? The exceeding great and precious promises, we might escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. I see the first Peter 1 or first Peter 2. I, I mean, I'm, I'm second Peter 2, 1. I, I forget which one it's in. Wherefore, given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these we might escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. God loves us, and he's given us his word to empower us to overcome and to live free from the bondage of sin and captivity to lust, the fleshly desires and lust and the things that are contrary to wholesome doctrine. God has empowered us to live that way if we walk according to it. Because God loves you. God's good. I said, God is good. He didn't have to do that. Do you know God could have just, when Adam and Eve did what they did, he could have just gone and melted the whole thing and said, that's it, I'm done with them. He could have. He could have just melted it. I mean, Adam and Eve could have been one of those casualties of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, I mean, you know, the ark comes out, the lightning bolts come out, and melts all the guys and all that kind of stuff. Pretty gross scene, but anyway, anyway. God could have done that. But the Bible says, in referring to Jesus, that he was slain from the foundation of the world. God, knowing all things and seeing man's sin, had already made provision for Jesus before the sin took place. Hallelujah. God's made a provision for you. He's good. Do not be deceived by the mindset that it doesn't matter what I do, God's already covered it. It does matter what you do, and God's got a covering for it if you confess and come to Him. That's His goodness in operation. I mean, there's a big argument in the church today whether First John 1, even now people who've been saying First John 1, 9 doesn't apply to the church are now writing and saying on the internet, don't, don't read Peter, James, or John because Paul rebuked them for not preaching grace. Now they're starting to say, get rid of that part of the Bible. Get rid of Peter, James. Don't, don't read Peter, James, or John. Because Paul rebuked them for not preaching grace right. 
Now, you can't, you, you, now they've already gotten rid of the Old Testament. Jesus was under the Old Covenant, so you don't listen to Jesus. You only listen to Paul. That's what the people, that's where they're going, that's where they're getting to. And of course, you're going to have to get rid, have to get rid of about half of what Paul writes, because Paul, like I said in Ephesians, on one half talks about the grace, the other side he talks about what man's responsibility is. So you're going to have to get rid of So when you get down to it, you're only going to have, and listen, are, are y'all ready for this one? They've already written a Bible called the, I forgot the name of the Bible, but there's a Bible out there, the Mirror Bible. And it's all about grace and they're leaving script. Some, some Bibles are now leaving out these new translations leaving out 1 John 1, 8 and 9, just leaving them out. Saying it didn't apply to the church. Folks, God is good. But he also said, if you take away or add to, oh, you're cursed. Who do you think you are rewriting the Bible to fit your wants? God loves you. God's made a provision when you sin. Oh, how good is God to have made the provision. And it's simple. I don't have to cut myself. I don't have to. I just come to the throne. And he said I can come with boldness. I don't have to come crawling in begging. I can come in and say I've sinned. Forgive me. I don't have to grovel. Are you here? I don't have to go give Pastor Ed four thousand dollars. Amen. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad it's not a monetary thing? It's just a heart thing. Forgive me for I sinned. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for this time together around your word. We thank you that your goodness is, is demonstrated in your forgiveness. We thank you that your goodness is demonstrated in your desire to make provision for failure of, of mankind. And even after the, we're born again, you've made provision. You've made, pro oh, how good you are. How could we argue with your goodness knowing the things you provided for us in Christ Jesus? And so today as we're here and as Christians are, are all in this room, we're in an attitude of prayer. If you're here today in Jesus Christ is not your Lord. Would you raise your hand? I want to pray with you. Bring, pray you and believe with you into the kingdom of God. I'm going to say, well, Pastor Ed, I'm born again, but I'm, I backslid. We want to pray with you. Or I'm not filled with the Holy Ghost. We, what do you mean by that? Exactly. Acts 2 4. They filled the Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Uh, anything you need prayer for, we want to pray with you. Anybody here this morning?